Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Nutan Limay. So Nutan works in uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, she did her PhD from uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. She is currently a faculty in the Computer Science and Engineering Department in IIT Bombay. So over to you, Nutan. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, for this session so late in the night. Um, I hope I don't make you fall asleep. Um, so I'll uh, talk a little bit about how to prove impossibility results. And um, in doing that, I would like if you uh, stop me, ask questions in the middle or, or you know, um, leave your comments in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, and of course, feel free to ask questions at the end as well. Uh, I'll uh, switch off my video for bandwidth reasons and so on, but uh, if you at some point want, I'll switch it on again. Okay, so uh, let's get started. We are going to talk about uh, impossibility results. Um, so you would have seen in mathematics, you've seen a lot of impossibility results. Uh, for example, can you write square root two as a fraction? P by Q, right? And uh, we all know that that is not possible. So that's an impossibility result. And uh, how does one go about proving this impossibility result? What is the impossibility result? Well, square root two cannot be written, no matter how clever you are, uh, how smart anybody else is, square root two can still not be written as a, a fraction of two integers, right? So, um, that's what uh, uh, an impossibility statement is. And how does one prove this statement? So perhaps most of you would have seen a basic proof for a statement like this. It proceeds as follows. You assume for the sake of contradiction that square root two can be written as a fraction. So say P by Q and uh, say they do not share any common factors. Then you do some simple arithmetic uh, square both the sides, take two on the other side, conclude that P square must be even because P square equals two times something. So of course, if P square is even, P must be even. Not only that, P square must be divisible by four because if P is even, there is a two sitting inside it and P square must, div uh, must be divisible by four, which then tells you that Q square uh, must be divisible by two, which means Q is divisible by two. But then that somehow gives us that P and Q have a common factor. But we started out with the assumption that they do not. So we come to a contradiction. And the only thing that we assumed at the very beginning was that in fact, square root two can be written as a fraction. So our assumption must be wrong. And that's the proof that square root two cannot be written as a fraction. So here I'm not really saying anything um, that you haven't seen before, uh, perhaps. And if you haven't seen the proof before, this is not a proof that is very hard to follow. I'm sure line by line, you have followed the proof. But what do I mean by computational impossibility, right? So in computation, we care about how one can solve a certain problem, okay? So for example, in mathematics, often we care about existence of things. But in computation, we also want to compute them efficiently. So here on the picture, you see some uh, uh, nice diagrams. And uh, the typical question that computational uh, complexity theorists uh, ask is, can a certain problem be solved efficiently? And what does efficient mean? Under certain resource bounds, typical resource bounds are, can I, uh, you know, solve it efficiently in some amount of time. Some may say that, oh, I want to use bounded amount of memory to solve the problem. Some others may say, I want to use bounded amount of energy to solve the problem and so on and so forth, right? So a resource could be anything, but the question is always, can I solve a certain problem with respect to, by, while respecting the bound, bounds on the res uh, resources. So here is a very simple problem. You are given a graph. Graph is nothing but a bunch of vertices, like right, these points. 
and connections between a pair of points. So some pair of points may have a connection between them. Certain pairs may not have a connection between them. So you just draw this connection graph and that connection uh, picture and that's your graph. And uh, you know, you can think of the graph depicting say friendships. If there is an edge between two vertices, then they are friends, else they are not friends, right? So uh, maybe you can draw the graph of people on Facebook this way and things like that. Okay, so you are given a graph and uh, you want to ask, can it be properly colored? What does proper coloring mean? Proper coloring means no two friends have the same color. So if there is an edge between two vertices, they do not have the same color. In this picture, for this specific example graph, you can color it with three colors, like it has been shown in this picture. There are multiple other ways perhaps to color this with three colors and you can figure it out offline. Now, I'll ask you a question. Can you solve this problem of given a graph, deciding whether it can be colored with three colors? And I claim, so can this problem be solved in some resource bound? Let's say in time n cube. Yeah, what can you do in n cube time? You can do something about three pair, triples of vertices and do some computation around it and so on. Or can you then show, this would be an impossibility result. Can you show that the problem cannot be solved using n cube time? Can you do either of the two? And believe me, uh, if you are able to solve this problem, and I, I'm not saying this uh, as a joke, this problem, if you are able to solve one way or the other, if you are able to prove that either there is an n-cube time algorithm or there is no n-cube time algorithm, you will win million dollars. Okay? And um, maybe I should keep my video on for the theatrics of this. So, you know, this is a million dollar question. You can Google it. It is called NP hardness. And uh, this, if you solve, you are going to get million dollar. And I'm, I'm not joking. This is not, I'm just saying million. It's a thousand, but I'm saying million or something. It's really million. Okay. And uh, why would such an impossibility result carry so much weight? Why would one want to prove such a thing that maybe this can't be solved in time and queue? What would, why would anybody be willing to pay you a million dollars for this? So first of all, such uh, impossibility results are uh, important uh, because they often give you like a counterpoint when you're trying to solve problems efficiently. So it tells you where to find the roadblocks. It helps you understand the power of computational resource itself. If you are able to prove something like this particular problem can't be solved in n-cube time, it also says something about n-cube time, how restricted it is or, or you know, uh, how, how much can it do? Another very, very practical reason to prove impossibility results is cryptography. So when we send secure communication on the internet, like you use your say credit card on Uber, or uh, you make online payment on Amazon, what you are trusting is a cryptographic system that is running behind to hide all your data, to encrypt all your data, so that spurious parties don't receive it in plain text or are able to crack it easily. And uh, the fact that there exists hard to solve problems lies at the core of this cryptography. So not only is it a mathematical pursuit, which by itself is beautiful, it also has practical implications. And speaking of mathematical pursuits, of course, all of us, uh, we like mathematics. And this question, though computationally, uh, computational in nature, has deep roots into mathematics. So uh, it naturally is a question that has uh, you know, drawn many mathematicians to computer science, for instance. Proving certain problems are not solvable easily uh, is the kind of thing that mathematicians have been doing for decades, uh, for centuries. And when you put a computational angle to it, often mathematicians are the ones who are uh, correctly poised for uh, actually attacking such problems. And this uh, we've seen time and again. So that's why uh, one wants to solve these impossibility problems. I haven't yet told you why this should cost, why somebody is willing to give you $1 million for this, but I'll come to that in a bit. 
So now if I have managed to convince you that proving impossibility results is really worthwhile, worth your time, then um, at least the ones who are sold to this idea would wonder, um, how shall I go about proving these, right? So, so for that, I'll just motivate it through some simple puzzles, okay? So uh, here is a puzzle, okay? You have, uh, this boy is uh, your little uh, brother and uh, your wristwatch is under one of these uh, glasses. And this uh, little brother is up to some pranks. And he says that, uh, uh, look, you can ask two types of questions. Is the watch placed after glass I? Or is it placed before glass I? He also says that he knows where it is. So to answer every question, he's going to charge you one chocolate. And he may answer yes or no. He's always going to answer correctly. So he's not trying to fool you or anything like that. He is a honest brother, but of course he's up to some pranks. He's a younger brother. Right, so now you need your wristwatch, you need to get out of the house and uh, you start asking him questions. Okay, and uh, I think it's quite easy to uh, imagine a protocol where what you do is um, as follows. For each I, you ask, is it placed before I? And you know, if it is placed in the, really the, so you start from one to N and you ask, is it placed before one? That means it will be inside one. Is it placed before two? Is it placed before three? So on and so forth. So, you know, this protocol is the simplest one. Just go on asking one after the other. And of course it will be in one of them. So you will get it at some point. But in this process, you may end up spending something like N, different, uh, you, you may end up paying N chocolates to your brother, which of course is not ideal. So if there were, say, um, uh, you have, a, so suppose you have 100 chocolates, but suppose there are 100, uh, I mean, you have 10 chocolates, but you have 100 glasses, then this strategy is certainly not, not a good one, right? So, um, let me ask if there is somebody in the audience who can come up with a better strategy. If there are 100 glasses and only 10 chocolates, can you figure out where your wristwatch is by asking whether the watch is before I or after I type of questions to your brother? So is there anybody in the audience who wants to uh, chip in here? Yes, um, Panchika, please go ahead. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I was saying we can directly uh, dive into the middle one. Then we can yes. ask uh, if it is before or after. Then if it's before, then we'll take the fifty percent before of the uh, before of the part, and then dive into the middle one of that, and then continue this process. Fantastic! Fantastic! Great work, uh, Nikita. You had a similar solution. I think you had also raised your yes, ma'am. Perfect. Great. Awesome. So exactly what you uh, both said. Uh, so you have the first and the last, you define a middle, and now you ask at the middle whether it is before or after. And if, it, it, uh, if you hit upon, if you get a yes answer, that is it is before the mid, then of course make the last address to mid. And uh, first, in the other situation, you know, go into the second half of the glasses. Continue like this. This is called the binary search. Anybody who has attended like a basic course in computer science would have guessed at least that there is something to do with binary search if they hadn't got the full solution. And in this process, can you see that we end up paying something like log n chocolates? Why log n? Because you know you can write the recursion, you can say that search in the array of list n can be divided into search of array of list n by two by paying one chocolate for reducing the size by half. And when you solve this recurrence, you get that search of n, which is counting the number of chocolates is log n. 
So indeed, uh, what you have managed to do is actually get a 10 chocolate algorithm per 100 classes. So you only manage to, you know, you manage to do your job. In fact, log of 100 to the base 2 is kind of smaller than 10. So you're good. Now the question would be the next natural question is why why do I even need to give log ten log hundred chocolates to my uh, little brother you know like as elder uh, sibling I am obviously trying to save my chocolates so uh, the next question would be can I do can I do this in fewer than log n chocolates and here is one uh, example placement of the uh, watch that sort of tells you that at least with respect to this strategy that, uh, you know, uh, Nikita and Vanshika uh, um, suggested, uh, it's not possible to, in this uh, example, you will see there are 16 classes. I have placed the watch in a specific way that defeats this strategy. That means this strategy will force you to pay four chocolates. So as follows, you know, if I place it in the ninth, glass i mean not me the brother places it in the nine glass if the brother is aware that you are going to use this binary search like strategy he would be most uh, clever to place it under the ninth glass because you will first ask the middle he will answer it is after the middle so you will go into that section then you will you know query the middle of that section he will say it is to the left of it then you will query the next middle. He'll again say it is to the left of it. And now when you will ask the last question, obviously, because there's just one glass remaining, uh, you will get the watch. But uh, in the process, uh, you have spent four chocolates. Okay, so at least for the strategy that we described and discussed, it doesn't look to be the case that you can uh, make do with less than four chocolates. But when I ask you, can we do better than this? So, so this is what I just said. The example showed that the specific algorithm, namely the binary search algorithm, cannot do better than log n, right? The 16 can be uh, generalized to n and uh, four can be generalized to log n in a similar example. Uh, I encourage you all to think about it. But you know, when I ask, can you do, can you solve this problem in less than log n steps? I'm not asking whether binary search can do better than log n. I'm asking a more general question. I'm asking, is there any algorithm that can do better? Yeah, that is very different from asking, can a specific algorithm do better? For a specific algorithm, we just saw an example. But when I say, can in general, any human being do better than this, uh, then I'm asking a more general question, right? Uh, so so that's, that's what I mean by uh, asking the impossibility question, okay? That is there an algorithm, any algorithm, maybe the most genius person in uh, the world may try to solve this problem and maybe that person will be able to uh, do it with less than log and chocolates, who's to know, right? So the question here is, can anybody do better than log n? And what we'll now show is a computational impossibility that no matter how clever you are, you may be the world's genius, but if you are only allowed to ask questions such as, can I do, is it before this or after this? This, this very simple type of questions, if you're restricted to this sort of questioning, then no matter how genius you are, you will, require something like log n many questions okay and um, how does one prove such a statement well we can visualize the algorithm that we are coming up with asking these questions as a tree okay the nodes of the tree the algo can be viewed, viewed as a tree each leaf of the tree represents a specific positioning of the watch there are n possible distinct placements of the watch. Okay, so what do I mean by this? For example, when we asked for the ninth, uh, when, when the watch was inside the ninth class, what were we asking? First, we asked whether it's less than eight, then we asked whether it's less than 12, then we asked whether it's less than 10, and then we asked whether it's less than nine. 
right? So this is this tree. And any algorithm, whoever may have designed it, however genius that person may be, that can be depicted as such a tree. So what are the properties of this tree? The leaves of the tree represent a specific positioning of the glass, of the watch. And there are n possible distinct placements for the watch. So what that means is the tree must have at least n distinct leaves one for each possible placement of the watch. But as you may know, any binary tree that has n different, um, n different leaves is, what can we say about it? It must have depth at least log n, right? So, What this now tells us as a result is that no matter who, which genius draws this tree, first of all, the, any algorithm in that sort of questioning will look like a tree. Let any genius draw this tree because the watch can be placed under any of the N glasses, the tree must have N leaves. And as soon as you say that a tree has N leaves, we know that its depth must be at least log N. This is a purely graph theoretic, uh, statement, yeah? And now this gives us a lower bound, what we call a lower bound or an impossibility statement. Okay. So I'm going to go over another puzzle. I'm going to give you another proof for showing impossibility uh, results. Um, so the idea of these pr proofs or the puzzles is to get you acquainted with what a typical impossibility result proof in the world of computer science may look like. It is not to say that each of them is going to be as simple as that, but in a talk like this, we will only look at the simple ones. But uh, you know that there can be different flavors to the same question and uh, we will come to, we will not discuss any of them here, but I will just point you to other resources and uh, where all this sits in the bigger picture of computer science shortly. So before I go into the second puzzle, let me pause for one full minute. Okay, I'll give you a whole minute. If you have any questions, comments, uh, you can post them or we'll have a silence for one minute. Then I'll go over to the next uh, puzzle. Ma'am, yeah. This computation was based on the fact that my n is even. Then I was dividing stuff. Okay. But if my n turns out to be odd, or if I make my brother make the n odd, hmm. then I have a better chance. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right that you have a better chance. But how much better is it? So, for example, depends if upon m. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Sorry. That's it. Okay, you said. <laughs> right, so, so it doesn't quantitatively improve. All it does is, okay, maybe you can get like log of n minus 1 or whatever, you know, like plus minus 1. That's all. But if we are to focus on terms that grow with n, then the savings are not so much. But you're right. In uh, very common situations, you may get a saving of maybe one or two chocolates for sure. Yeah, that's right. Any other question? Okay, so that's great. So let's move on to the next puzzle. As I said, we will. Um, so again, now you, it's your, 
your chance to get back at your brother so you know um so you say that you have a surprise for your brother you have n boxes and <laughs> you put a googly the saying that you know either none of the boxes will have any gifts in them or at least half of them will have gifts okay so either none of them have any gifts or half of them have gifts and the way he can question now is he can open one box at a time okay that's all he gets to do and now if he opens the box he gets to see what is inside it and not but for every box he opens he has to give you one chocolate okay so you have put a reverse game on him now and uh, now he has to decide which one of the two cases is it is it that you have decided to keep no uh, uh, gifts at all or you have decided to keep half uh, boxes filled with gifts so the kind of questions he is allowed to ask is does the ayat box contain a gift which is equivalent to he just opening the ayat box and checking whether there is a gift and very simply you can see that if first n by 2 answers are no then there are no gifts in all the boxes because obviously uh, he's opened half of them so if the other situation is at least half of them have uh, chocolates in them then well um, you know uh, it's not the case he's figured out um if there were more than if he finds at least one box with a chocolate then of course that's the only situation that is possible that at least half of them have gifts in them so the brother will never give you more than n by 2 chocolates that's clear right uh, that's very trivial to see now it is the question for your brother can your brother pay less than n by 2 chocolates and be able to figure out um which of the two cases is it and uh, with a show of hands raise your hand if you feel that your brother must pay n by 2 chocolates he has no other go okay i see one raised hand i hope it is not for a question no it's not for a question yeah okay others have no opinion at this point okay so me also feels that he has to pay okay given that we've already given him log and chocolates we he better have to pay right okay more hands now raised for uh, he has to pay all right so indeed you are all correct um he has to pay and uh, let's see why but before i before we argue why let's just precisely ask this question uh, the way i mean it 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 should be asked in the way that we intend to ask it so if, the question is if he has already decided a strategy to ask his questions is there a way for you as the sister to put the gifts in a way that he must pay n by 2 chocolates so i'm asking this question okay so no for a given strategy is there a way to place uh the gifts in a way that he must pay n by 2 chocolates right and uh, what one can see is something stronger which is no matter what strategy he chooses to open the boxes with there is one placement so for every strategy he chooses there is a placement of boxes that you have at your disposal the way such that if you place the gifts in that way you will receive at least n by 2 chocolates okay so note the pontification again to argue this correctly we can think of again um 
the algorithm that asks these questions are brother as a tree this is also known to be a decision tree what it does is at every node of the tree it asks which just labels a box i1 i2 i3 this tree is a very specific looking one because if at i1 the answer is yes then your brother doesn't need to pay you any chocolates so the protocol basically ends here but if your answer is no then he opens yet another box this is because if even one box contains the chocolate he knows it has to be the case where you placed uh, sorry if one box finds a gift then he knows it is in the situation where you have at least n by 2 gifts inside the boxes so this is how the tree looks and now imagine any ordering of opening the boxes that is your brother's strategy here okay strategy is nothing but an ordering in which he decides to open the boxes for every strategy you can easily imagine there is a placement of the gifts in the rest of the boxes okay as long as this t is not n by 2 yet there is a placement of the gifts in n minus t boxes which will enforce a payment of t chocolates just put it in the boxes that are not yet opened okay and if he reveals the order in which if he reveals this tree to you which is like revealing the strategy you can come up with a placement of the boxes where he is forced to pay n by 2 chocolates this argument is also known to be the adversarial argument and why did i choose this puzzle and um, this sort of a uh, situation this is not a very realistic situation right like the real situation should have been there is a gift under some box and now i mean if you are a sister who is trying to gain as many chocolates as possible really what you should have done is you should have told him either there is a gift under one of the boxes or none at all now figure out how many but why did i choose to uh, you know define the problem or the puzzle in a stupid way well one reason is that actually this maps to something very nice okay this is called a promise or function what is a promise or function it's precisely the puzzle the promise or function is a function over n bits each xi is either a zero or a one it's a boolean function and it evaluates to one if half of the xi uh, if the xi sum up to anything more than n by 2 okay but if xi sum up to 0 it evaluates to 0 and the function is a partial function it's not defined everywhere okay it's only defined over such inputs which was what we were doing and what we drew on the previous slide the question mark tree with no labels in every box is actually known to be a decision tree you can google these phrases later if any of this looks interesting to you and what we were asking actually in the puzzle was that what is the minimum depth tree decision tree for solving the promise or problem right because at every node we were asking is this bit 0 or 1 if there is a gift inside a box the bit is 1 if there is no gift inside the box the bit is 0 and by querying different bits which is what a decision tree is going to do we are trying to figure out which among the two cases does my input belong to for this promise or function and therefore this is a decision tree and now when i say that i want to find the best strategy for solving this promise or problem what i'm asking essentially is to find the tree with minimum depth and what our impossibility result says from the previous uh, argument is that no matter what tree you come up with the minimum depth of any tree has to be at least n by 2 okay so this is sort of known as the decision tree complexity of a function and in this case we analyze the promise of our function well decision uh, the previous slide had uh, if there are let me pause actually just uh, yeah if there are any questions uh please feel free to ask i'll pause for like 10 seconds and uh, we'll see if some questions come up or hand raises
Okay, so maybe you can put the questions in the chat if something is unclear or, you know, if you just have a comment or something like that, feel free to do that. So, um, you know, I just gave you like a very layman's version of that whole protocol and the tree and so on. But, you know, you can go crazy with the, uh, with the kind of versions of this problem that you can come up with. For example, you can say, what if the brother was allowed to, you know, uh, randomly pick a box and ask whether for a randomly chosen uh, box, is there a gift in inside it? Now it is a randomized strategy. Now as a sister, you need to defeat randomized strategies like this. Then is now the brother required really to pay and buy two chocolates or maybe he can have a cleverer way of doing this. And in fact, if he's allowed to ask randomized questions, you can imagine that he can actually solve this problem with very few chocolates. I mean, by giving you very few chocolates. Do you see why? So what he can do is just pick a random box and ask, is there a chocolate inside that? Now, if you know that either none of them have any, uh, is there a gift inside that? And if you know that either none of them have any gifts or at least half of them have gifts, then for a randomly chosen box, what is the probability that he will see a, a gift inside it? If indeed there were more than n by two uh, gifts in the boxes, the probability is at least half. Okay, so for a randomly chosen uh, box with probability at least half, he will see just with one query a gift if there were indeed more than n by too many gifts inside the boxes. So by just using one with probability half, he would have figured out which of the two cases is it. Okay, so now this becomes quite trivial in the randomized world. Let me make the question complicated. As I told you as a sister, I should be designing the puzzle in a way that I get maximum number of chocolates. And if I put either half of the boxes will have chocolate, uh, half of the box will have boxes will have gifts or none at all, then, uh, you know, I'm setting myself up against such uh, randomized querying strategies of my brother. So here is another possibility that I can think of, which is that just say that now I'll make the problem difficult for you. You know, it's not like half of them will have and none, otherwise none of them will have. It's, it's that maybe just one of them would have a gift. So he needs to distinguish between, is it the case that, distinguish between the following two cases. There are no gifts in any boxes or there are some number of gifts in, non-zero number of gifts in the boxes. And non-zero could even mean one or two, you know. And now suddenly the randomized strategy doesn't look all that good because if, if indeed there were only one gift, then with probability only one by N, he will be able to choose the correct box. And now his probability of success has gone down from half to one by N, which doesn't look very promising anymore. In fact, in this setting, by a similar decision tree kind of argument that we gave, um, a couple of slides ago, you can even argue that no randomized querying algorithm can also have a strategy that can make do with less than n by too many questions. So indeed, one can prove an impossibility result for such an algorithm saying that it must use n by too many queries. Any randomized algorithm must also use n by too many queries. Then you may go even more bonkers and say, what about quantum queries? I haven't even defined what they are, right? So let's not even get there. So, but just to throw in some uh, fun trivia for you. In fact, if you're allowed to use quantum queries, I haven't defined what they are. So it's okay if you don't understand what they are, but say you are interested in something that sounds like this, you can Google it offline. And what is known is that if you're allowed quantum queries, then in fact, there is a strategy that can do better than n by two. In fact, there is a strategy that can 
work with only square root n many queries. And uh, this quantum like query complexity uh, question has tons of other applications which are not immediately obvious, but they, there are connections, very deep connections to things like Schwartz algorithm and Chebyshev polynomials. So I, I'm not going to go there, but just throwing in some terminology and some you know, uh, key phrases at you if you feel interested in any of this. Okay, so now we have gone through a couple of uh, puzzles and um, I'm kind of coming close to the end of my uh, talk, but I want to uh, just speak a little bit about what do we know about computational impossibility? So what I did in puzzle one and puzzle two was that I looked at very restricted kind of algorithms and I showed you or demonstrated how to prove impossibility results for those restricted algorithms. But you know, in computation, we don't have a simple algorithm where you only ask whether this is larger or smaller or, you know, like not all algorithms look this simple. So for all arbitrary algorithms that all the geniuses of the world may come up with, suppose I were to write, give impossibility results or prove certain things are not doable. Uh, that looks like a uphill, uh, uh, you know, that, that looks like a difficult task. Um, so let, let's see what we know about computational impossibilities. So truly what we know is only a drop in the ocean. There are problems that are known to be intractable, like no computer can solve it. And uh, those, uh, those results are known to be, um, uh, these are very classical results by now, and they are proved using the technique called diagonalization. So Cantor's diagonalization is a technique that is used, for example, to show that reals are denser than integers in mathematics. And when you, you know, computationally uh, adapt the proof, it says something about what are tractable versus intractable problems. So this sort of a thing is known. For most resources, hierarchy theorems are known, which say that there are problems solvable with more resources, which are not solvable by fewer resources. These statements are only existential. So we only know that there exist problems that are solvable by more resources, which are not solvable by fewer resources. Okay, this is provably true unconditionally, but only in terms of existence of such problems. And this also, the, uh, uh, the proofs are classical by now in computer science and proceed by diagonalization. Now, the real um, uh, computational complexity thinking kind of started at the with the backdrop of the Cold War. Uh, during the Cold War, you know, 60s, 70s and so on, Steve Cook, a researcher in computer science who was sitting in the US and Leonid Levin, a researcher who was sitting in uh, USSR, Russia, um, you know, both of them in some capacity or the other actually working with the government as well. The two countries were at Cold War for decades and they were both looking at certain similar computational problems. And what happened, this can only happen in uh, mathematics and uh, fields like this, they both discovered a set of problems such that everybody in their domain were trying to solve those problems, but they were very hard. But all the hard problems were somehow related to each other through this really strange maze. And nobody was able to show that these are impossible to solve for humans. You know, nobody was able to solve them. That's one thing that is nobody is today clever enough to be able to come up with algorithms for this. They were all related. So they were important problems, all related. If you solve one, you will be able to solve the other and things like that. Such statements were known about them. But unfortunately, nobody was able to show that they are not even solvable. Okay, both of them stumbled upon this theory, which is called the NP-hardness theory now. And uh, such problems are called NP-hard problems. And in fact, cycling back to the problem that we started out with, which was the colorability problem that I told, told you about, this is one such problem. This is an NP-hard problem. And in fact, 
because it is related to so many interesting important problems and that we do not know how to solve all of them from the 70s when they got defined um there is as i said um you know lot at stake uh, for this and uh, the question as i asked you earlier can we show that there are no efficient algorithms for mp hard problems this is this is an impossibility statement uh, it would be very interesting and will uh, give you a million dollars for solving it if you are able to prove something like this okay so so that that was my uh, little pitch for what impossibility statements look like in computer science uh what we know which is far far too little what we would like to prove which is on this slide among many other interesting things that we would like to prove now i'm kind of coming just to my very very last slide uh maybe second last here is the overall picture of the landscape of impossibility results computational interactability the very first thing i told you where diagonalization proof gets uh, used as i told you these computational interactabilities were discovered in 40s and 50s in uh, 1940s and 50s i should say now that we are approaching 40s and 50s of 2000 soon uh, i should be specific but 1940s and 50s and in mathematics it could have been 1840s and 50s so i really should be very careful so 1940s and 50s computational interactability was discovered this was even before the very first computer was ever created by the way right so people were thinking about computation even before computer came up because computational thinking is a lot like mathematics you know it doesn't need a computer really um in the 70s the other hierarchy theorems like i was telling you about came about like you know more resources can get you more computational power in the 80s the first landmark unconditional lower bound was proven and uh, this was very celebrated and uh, major breakthrough all the way to now in 2010 was the most recent breakthrough okay but if you look at where we want to be for those million dollars say million dollars our goal or solving mathematically beautiful problems is our goal really we want to be beyond this point you know beyond this point all great things happen there are rainbows and there is cryptography and there is no randomness and everything very nice beautiful world we don't know how to get there that's the goal we are somewhere here right and at every peak we feel like we've just made it but you know there's a lot more to go ahead so so think of this talk or you know this whole uh, interaction we just had as an invitation to come and prove lower bounds you could prove them in mathematics you know great that would be great lot of mathematical um, impossibilities have led to computational impossibilities just like i told you cantor's diagonalization in mathematics adapted to computer science gives a diagonalization result in computer science so invitation to proving lower bounds in mathematics in computer science what's the road ahead uh, one needs to come up with innovative new techniques one needs to come up with ways of finding connections between computational impossibilities and other areas like cryptography is one such connection but maybe there are many more connections and that's where people who get into this area could contribute and let me assure you that because this is such a vast area and such a beautiful one there is room for everyone so if you feel you have mathematical skills you know linear algebra you know this that some of the ma basic math tools this field is for you uh, so with that uh, let me kind of uh, stop here and see if there are any questions maybe we can even go back to a few things or cover other things if you like Yeah, show me, please go ahead. You raise your hand. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful session. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I'm happy that everybody has. Uh, some of you are at least awake. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Th
I think I lost you there. Are others able to hear, Swami? Mm, I don't know whether I'm able to. Not, I, not, I, not, I, not hear to me also. Okay. So, Swami, could you type your question? Maybe, perhaps, uh, is that possible? I will answer it uh, verbally. I'm trying to see where I'll see the chat. I very confidently said that I'll look at the chat. It's but... a question about oh, yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. says thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I must come, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Another question. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm here. Okay. Can I help you with something? Can you hear that it's me? Yeah, I can hear. So my question is, here we have defined whatever problems we discussed till now. We have defined our rules as in it's random draws that the brother is making or if it's he's not deciding the strategy or otherwise how many gifts are placed inside it. So we know the number of gifts that are there and what that the draws are random. Right. But whatever practical problems we come across may not may not be random like there may be associated causes right. associated to them but otherwise it's not most of the time random as as for an example in my case my field is economics so what we do there's this very famous nobel prize economist abhijit banerjee what he does is he conducts a uh, randomized control trials That's where, yeah so so we, he lands up at very good results as in one place people were not vaccinating and then they were given half a kg pulses and suddenly everyone was vaccinating so right. it was a random thing but we landed up at a very good chocolate so is there a way to land up at a lot of chocolate the maximum number of chocolates that we land upon in the minimum number of trials i don't i know that this is a very twisted problem to what we discussed now but as far as computational point of view is concerned Right, 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 right. So very interesting. So it's great to know that you're working on economics. That's a great area. A lot of connections between economics and computer science as well, actually. And uh, especially coming up with, say, randomized trials and so on, it takes a lot of computational thinking and, uh, you know, designing the experiments correctly. Not so much in that setting that you are so worried about impossibility results, because impossibility results are sort of uh, trying to say that no matter what kind of uh, thing you design, uh, it may not work. And this is more sort of uh, useful. This kind of thinking is more useful when uh, you are dealing with, you know, growing numbers, not uh, so when you do control trials or something like that, maybe you're dealing with slightly different problems. Having said that, um, you posed like a variant of this that, you know, a variant of the problem I mentioned that, oh, can I get maximum number of chocolates? And what is an algorithm for that, right? So these kind of problems are not exactly the problems I talked about, like decision problem. What's a decision problem? Is it something, is something true or not? That's a decision problem. 
What you're asking is an optimization question. Can I maximize my gains? This is typically what happens in game theory and so on. Yes, and even for that, even for that, there are there's a whole theory of optimization problems showing optimization problems are NP hard. Then coming up with approximation algorithms for these optimization problems, and this is all again back to complexity. So though you know you may not directly be related. Uh, there is a way to sort of formally define those problems in this setting and study them at this meta level. So indeed, uh, one could do that. That answers my question. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. I didn't get your name, but uh, thanks. Yeah. It was Nikita, and I really like the way you presented it. As in, if it's written in letters, typed on keyboards, it's a little difficult to connect with. When it was written in an handwriting, we know that what exactly was going on there. So thanks for that. Thanks. Yeah, actually, it works better for me also. But these slides, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I put in some effort in drawing those pictures. I'm not very great at it, but during this talk, I learned a lot. I think making this talk, I learned a lot. Uh, so Swami says that uh, uh, you told that cryptocurrency is based on these principles, and cryptocurrency is frequently in use. So my question is how blockchain principle works in cryptocurrency. Okay, so I am no expert in cryptocurrency or blockchain. Okay, so really I shouldn't be answering this question. Um, as far as I understand, blockchain also uses heavy amount of uh, existence of hard functions. They are already, I think, um, I may be, so don't quote me on this, but uh, if I understand, whatever I, little I understand in that area, they are looking at, Assuming, so they, they sort of don't rely on NP hardness, which is considered to be uh, kind of one level of impossibility in computation. There are several levels of impossibility in computation. There is uh, classical incomputability or, uh, you know, impossibility. There is a quantum impossibility. And today's cryptographic codes even go beyond that, assuming something even harder is truly hard. So blockchain at the core of it uses computational impossibility the way I said, uh, you know, but how do crypt so how does blockchain principle work in cryptocurrency? This, I don't know how to answer. This you have to ask an expert in crypto uh, to answer that. But I can tell you that the way the hardness is built into these systems, the, the, if I sit down and I have to argue why these systems are not breakable, I will end up using a computational impossibility result as an assumption somewhere in this proof of, uh, you know, unbreakability of some of these codes. And that's what I think is uh, what I was talking about. Yeah. I don't know whether Thank you, I answered your question. Thank you very much, Ozil. So I think so. We, we have some voice issues for sure. So I'm not able to hear you. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Ma'am, one more question. Yeah, please go ahead. Ma'am, it's Nikita, if you can't yeah, yeah. Please go ahead, yeah. So if we are talking of, about NP hardness and cryptocurrency, what, I, what little I know about it is that these codes need to be unbreakable, as in these hash functions need not match again, as in the functional value that you get should not match to the X that you had put in in the first place. So is that what you are trying to imply when you say that they are NP hard? So uh, there, is, there is a different sort of hardness that people assume in uh, uh, cryptography, which is called the one existence of one-way functions. What are one-way functions? Like the hash functions you're talking about, right? They are very easy to compute in one direction, but if you try to invert them, they're impossibly hard. So for instance, multiplication is an easy problem, right? You're given a bunch of prime numbers or powers of prime numbers, and you want to multiply them. We all know there is very efficient algorithm for it. But if I'm, given, I'm giving you a very large number, can you factor it? So factorization is kind of the inverse uh, of multiplication in some sense. And inverting the multiplication function is, uh, assumed to be sort of hard, right? And the very first uh, few cryptography codes were based on the assumption that any uh, reasonable computational, uh, pow computationally powerful person 
will require a lot of time to invert this multiplication map that is to factor things so you know multiplication is like a one way function because forward is easy but reverse is not easy to compute and uh, existence of such one way functions is what is used inside uh, cryptography and as long as they are one way even if they are not just np hard they may be even harder if there is this one way function that this is ideal one way function if it exists we have cryptography we don't know how to show that there is a one way function right so we just hope that there are these functions which are easy to compute in one direction but hard to invert and all of cryptography sort of based on assumptions i i wouldn't say all there are other um, premises that people are using now but at least classical cryptography was based on uh, existence of such one way function yes thank you ma'am yeah thank you thank you so much are there any more questions so uh, yeah if if not then uh, let's uh, thank nutan Thank you, Nutan. Uh, always loved your talk and loved it today. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this chance. I really like uh, coming here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye.